Well, good morning, church, and happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you watching online as well. We welcome you today. Uh, if you, hey, if you didn't get a ticket, uh, gentlemen, raise your hand, and we're going to get you a ticket right now. We've got some giveaways because it's exciting to get things like free at church, right? I mean, that's fun, isn't it? That's fun. So we'll be passing those tickets around as we do that. If you're brand new with us, we'd love to just bless people on Father's Day and Mother's Day and any other day that we can. And so uh, if you're new with us, download our church app and get connected. You saw the red, white, and boom, the July 4th video. Come and join us for that and sign up to serve an hour. If you're here in the house, we need that. We have the sign-ups out in the lobby if you check those out. And uh, if, if bring a lawn chair as well, because we're going to have a band I hear and uh, some other fun things to do. So come and hang out all evening with us. But let's check out what's coming up. Uh, today, groups begin. And for those of you who are hosting groups, I want to thank you for doing that. So check out our app and the information there. Uh, Red, white, and boom sign-ups. Ladies, luncheon coming up on Tuesday and Bible Bucks coming up on the 23rd. And uh, if you don't receive our weekly email, I encourage you just to sign up for that so you can get all the details about what's coming, coming up and what's going on here at the church so you can get connected. Um, as we think about worshiping through giving right now, I want to put this Ecclesiastes 5 up on the screen, 5 and verse 10. Uh, and the Bible reads this, whoever loves money always has enough. Whoever loves money, well, is always satisfied with their income. No, it doesn't say that, does it? It says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. And that's from the Old Testament. We learned then in the New Testament, uh, the Bible says the love of money, uh, not just money, but the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Why? Because money so much distracts us from the things of God. So if you're not in a habit of regular giving, uh, think about that um, and think about what your attitude is toward giving and see how God could um, help with that as you investigate and learn what God has to say about finances. So I'd like to just pray for an offering right now if you'd bow your heads with me. Father, we give you thanks. Oh, we give you thanks for being our God. We give you thanks for knowing what you came to give us uh, an abundant life. It starts with just having all of our sins wiped clean. But then you give us steps along the way as we grow in you. As you transform us, you call it the abundant life, living the life that's truly life. I pray today as we think about giving, as we give, that you would receive our offerings and our tithes. And Lord, it, it would just grow your kingdom. We thank you for Jesus, and we ask this in his name. Amen. Amen. So since it's Father's Day, check out the video. Our dads and our fathers mold us, shape us, and love us. But they're not always portrayed that way. In our sitcoms and our commercials, dads are imaged as clumsy and even clueless. In our movies and our media, Fathers are viewed as emotionally distant and as secondary caregivers. Sometimes they're displayed as lacking compassion or sympathy or understanding. But that's not the story we see in our church. Over and over and over, we see men who are breaking the mold. We see fathers who love their children with passion, with care, and with purpose. We see dads who work harder than ever in a complex world to allow every member of their family to flourish. We see grandfathers who are actively involved in the lives of their children and their grandchildren. We see men without any biological children of their own who mentor and disciple the next generation of young people. They're at the school play. They're reading the Bible and praying at bedtime. They're real men who are trying their best to love their wives just like Jesus loves his bride. Do they fail? Of course they do. But by the grace and power of God, they get back up and they try again. They're not perfect, but they're surrendering themselves as they become all that God wants them to be. 
So on a day like today, on this Father's Day, we just want you to know that we see you and we are grateful for you. Thank you, Dad, for everything. So we have some giveaways. So you got your tickets ready. Everybody got a ticket. All right, the last three digits, 291, 291. Anybody? Right over here. All right, AD. Hey, you get a motion-activated garage. Or do they get to pick? We don't. No, you get a motion-activated garage light. So here it comes. I think you can just throw it. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know, all right, here we go, here we go. This is fun. 226. I need to get a ticket next time. 226. 226. Any, anybody? Back there? I can't see you back there. Tom? Yeah, look at that. You get a BBQ smoker set with a gift card. <laughs> Woo! This last gift we, we got uh, for free, Bronco's backpack <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, we can be proud of that. 384. 384. Anybody? Let's, I'm going to look over here because that's probably where it's, it's going to be, huh? 384. 384. Nobody wants to claim the Broncos <laughs> backpack, do they? Nobody? They must be in the bathroom. Okay. 286. 286. Well, sure enough, my goodness, the Broncos back. I'll buy that off of you for 10 bucks. What? Isn't that fun? I just love having that fun at church. It's, it's great. It's good stuff. All right. Hey, today, if you're joining us, we're finish up and we're finishing this series on the book of Ruth, the Old Testament book of Ruth called When Life Happens, which is a perfect way to wrap it up on this Father's Day because men... If we were to call this book, if, we were, if this book were a movie, what would it be, men? It'd be a chick flick. Yeah, because out of the 85 verses in the Bible or in that book, 55 of them are dialogue. And uh, if you haven't been with us, uh, we've been talking about Ruth. She's a Moabite widow who left Moab to pursue God. And we've been highlighting this truth throughout this series and that is to get to the right place, you have to leave the wrong one. In other words, uh, if you want to get to the blessings of Bethlehem, you've got to turn your back on Moab. And uh, Ruth chapter 1 and verse 16 is a familiar verse, uh, probably the most popular from Ruth. This is when Ruth is talking to Naomi, and she says to her mother-in-law, Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. So today we're going to look at chapter 4, and I, I got a really creative title for today's message called Chapter 4. <laughs> chapter 4. And today I want to talk to those of you who might be disappointed in the season that you are in your life right now. And um, it's not that you don't believe in God. Uh, you believe in God, uh, but right now you might not be seeing his goodness in your life. And, and maybe some of you at this point in your life thought you would be financially strong and you'd be able to be generous and give to others, but you find yourself in a season where it looks like, I don't even know how I'm going to make it to the end of the month because of financial strain. For some of you, you dreamed about having a God-honoring marriage, and you, you dreamed about that, but that didn't happen. Your dream got put on hold. For others of you, that dream turned into a nightmare. Some of you, by this time in your life, you, you thought you'd be happy. You thought you'd be content in life and have a great ministry filled with joy, but you find yourself feeling lonely and depressed. So if you're trying to find the faith to, to, to move on to something better, I'm praying that God would speak directly to you in this message today, that he would give you hope and build your faith as we look at this final uh, passage in the book of Ruth. So I want to begin by summarizing where we've been in this series. If you remember in chapter one, Ruth hit rock bottom. You know, she uh, and her mother-in-law, they lost their husbands. They were widowed, no job, no means of support, and they really had lost hope. So we could say in chapter one that Ruth experienced heartbreak, she experienced loss and tremendous pain in this season in her life. 
And then she makes a decision. Do you remember what her decision was? She decided to leave the sinfulness of Moab and to pursue the one true God in Bethlehem. And so she went back to Bethlehem to pursue God. And we could say in chapter 2 that, that she worked and, and she waited and she served during this season. Instead of uh, selling herself like many women would have done in, in her shape, the situation she was in, um, she went and worked. She gleaned in the fields uh, of a guy named Boaz, in fact, and she served faithfully while waiting on God. So Boaz asked her to lunch. It was a, a lunch date. The sparks were flying. There were butterflies, and she got pretty excited. Maybe this is the one. Maybe, maybe this is the one that's going to redeem me. He's an honorable man. He's a man of standing. But then he kind of ghosted her, and he didn't follow her on social media, and we talked about that, if you remember that. So in chapter 3, we see um, she does a few things. She initiates, and she surrenders and she trusts. So she initiates. She puts herself in the path of this guy, literally. And she shows up one night at the foot of his bed, and she goes, boo, remember me? And that was weird. You know, we talked about that. And, and by the way, that's not, nothing that we recommend in premarital counseling, that you would just show up in the middle of the night. But that's what she did. And she trusted God, and she waited. And then in chapter 4, we see God's goodness when she is redeemed and she's restored and the whole community is now rejoicing, celebrating the goodness of God in this season. So <clears throat> it's a journey from chapter 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3, finally then to chapter 4. So for those of you who may feel stuck in chapter 1, I want you to know that, that God loves you. He cares about you. He is with you even if you don't see him right now. And for those of you who are in the in between stages, you're waiting. Uh, you're in chapter two. Stay faithful to God in chapter two. If you're in chapter three, trust God. Stay uh, in, in a situation where you're trusting in God. And my prayer for you is that you'll discover in chapter four that, that God is able. God is able. God's able to transform your life in chapter four. Into something, that, into something better than you could ever really imagine because he's a good God. He's a faithful God, and his word is true. So let's pick up where we left off last week. You remember Boaz wanted to redeem Ruth. There was a guy in the way, a closer relative, a kinsman redeemer, and uh, he, he was called Mr. No Name because the Bible writer uh, of, of the book here, Samuel, he didn't even want to list this name. And so he makes this deal. He, is, he has a plan. He works his plan. And it, the elders at the city gate pray this prayer blessing, and they pray this in, in chapter 4 and verse 11. May the Lord make Ruth, who is coming into your home, like Rachel and Leah, from whom all the nation of Israel descended. May you prosper and be famous in Bethlehem. So the elders pray one prayer of faith. And suddenly we see that that one prayer resulted in a changed life, a changed family, and ultimately in a changed legacy that even touches us even today. One prayer. So never underestimate what God can do through the power of prayer. And some of you right now, you might be one prayer away from the blessings that God wants to bring into your life. And so we actually see an answer to this prayer in verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife, his Isha in the Hebrew. Hebrew it's Isha. They got married, the two became one flesh. When he slept with her, the Lord what? The Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. One verse, and we see the answer of one prayer, and it demonstrates how God can take years of brokenness and turn it into blessings. And when I say years of brokenness, remember Naomi and Ruth were 10 years in Moab experiencing the pain. So sometimes a chapter might be a really long time. Now, there's a phrase in that verse I don't want you to miss, the one underlined, the Lord enabled, the Lord enabled. Who enabled? Who brought all this about? It was the Lord that enabled. And the Hebrew phrase for uh, the Lord enabled is this phrase, Yahweh way yitten. Yahweh way yitten. And this phrase is actually translated different ways in different Bible translations. In the NIV, it says the Lord enabled. And then in the, CB, in the ESV, it's translated, translated the Lord gave. Another version, the CBS, 
version says, the CSB version says, the Lord granted, the Good News translation says, the Lord blessed. So no matter how you say it, it's the Lord who did it. So what did he do? He is a giving God. He's a granting God. He's an enabling God. He's a God of blessings. The Lord enabled. And for you, for you, it might be a different translation of the verb. It might be the Lord provided or the Lord healed or, or the Lord answered or the Lord restored or the Lord opened up a door or the Lord proved himself faithful. The Lord made a way when there didn't seem to be a way. Who is it that enables? It's Yahweh, way yitten. So whatever you're facing today, I, I came to tell somebody that God is able. God is able. Ephesians 3 and verse 20 says this. Now to God, who is what? Able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. So he's able. And he can actually do more than what we ever think or ask or imagine. And some of you perhaps have the thoughts right now that I've had before in my life. Well, if God's able, why hasn't he? Well, if he's able, why am I sitting here waiting on him to do it? And I'm guessing that would have been the similar thought that Ruth would have had back in chapter 1 after her husband died. That might have been what she thought in chapter 2 when she's working her fingers to the bone just to survive. And in chapter 3 when she meets this cute guy who might be the one, but he ghosts her. Where are you, God? I'm here. I'm waiting. And maybe you've had that similar thought in your life. You know, why, God, didn't you heal the person I love when I prayed? God, why didn't you keep that marriage intact? God, why didn't you come through in the way I thought you would come through? Where are you, God? And you're waiting. You're stuck. Maybe you're stuck in chapter 1 or chapter 2 or chapter 3, and I want to remind somebody today, while you're waiting, God's still working. While you're waiting, even though you may not see God, it doesn't mean that he's not active. And what I love about Ruth is she, 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 when she didn't see anything, when she couldn't see the goodness of God, what did she do? She held on to her faith. She trusted. Even though her circumstances were terrible, she didn't let her circumstances define who her view of God was. And she kept on trusting. Because why? She knew Yahweh way yitten. God is able. And he has an answer for every problem that we face. In fact, I did something like this um, in my prayer journal years ago, and um, I want to do it with God is able, and I just want to go through the ABCs and see what God is like able to do. And uh, we're going to put that for A, you know what's God do? He answers our prayers. B, he blesses you abundantly. C, he comforts you when you're hurting. D, he delivers you from evil. E, he empowers you to do his will. He forgives all of your sin. Thank the Lord that he forgives us of our sins. And he, G, gives us uh, your daily bread. He heals you when you're sick. He illuminates your path. J, he justifies you by his amazing grace. K, he keeps you from stumbling. L, he loves you no matter what. M, he moves your mountains. Um, and he never leaves nor forsake you. Oh, he overcomes all your enemies by the blood of the lamb, by the words of your testimony. P, he provides all of your needs for all of your needs. Q, he quiets your darkest fears. R, he restores what is lost. He restores your soul. S, he strengthens you while you're weak. T, he transforms your life. He understands you what you're going through in your pain. V, he vanishes your darkness. W, he works all things together for the good of those who love him. And X, he extends you grace. And give me some grace too, because I know it starts with an E, but there's an X right there. <laughs> and he yearns for all of your heart. And Z, he zealously pursues you with unconditional love. So whatever your need, Yahweh, way yitten, God is able He's able to do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine. Whatever you can think of, he can do even more. And, and we see God's ableness in the answer to this prayer, verse 14. Then the, word of, then the women of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord who has now provided a redeemer for your family. Why are they worshiping God? It, it wasn't for 
uh, Boaz's financial success. It, it wasn't that he got a promotion. It wasn't that they got to take a dream vacation. It was that God provided for their family a legacy. He gave them life. God is the giver of life, the giver of all life. All life comes from God. It is a gift from God. And we see them praising God for what he provided. It goes on, may, may this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been what? Better to you than seven sons. Now, it's important to note now, they're, we're, they're celebrating Naomi's blessed life right now, and, but I want you to understand that this wasn't anything close to her plan. She never planned to leave Bethlehem. She never planned to have her husband die and for her to be destitute. That wasn't anywhere close to her plan, but God had a better plan, and he restored her life, and Ruth now was part of that better plan. Somebody say better. 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 Some of you right now are in a place that you didn't plan, and, and maybe you're disappointed where you are right now. I want to remind you that God's able, and God has a better plan. God's plan is better. Would you turn to the person next to you and say, God's plan is better? Turn to the person on the other side of you who's your second choice and say, God's, ban God's plan is better for you too. And you can type that in the chat, God's plan is better. <laughs> I'll give you a little example of this. Denise, uh, there were seven kids in her family. Uh, she was the baby. Uh, I was the baby in my family. I just had one older sibling, my sister Pam, four and a half years older than me. And uh, so when Denise and I got married, we, uh, we didn't have a plan for growing our family. And I told you a couple of weeks ago, we were a blended family, and that lent difficulty in itself. And uh, three years passed, and so we got a plan. We were excited about our plan, and so we were going to pray about growing our family, and we sat down and prayed, uh, God, should we start a family? And uh, Boom, you know, Denise got pregnant, and we realized when we did the calculation, our plan, we prayed about it, but when we realized what had happened, she was pregnant two weeks earlier than our plan. God had a better plan. <laughs> and people ask, well, hey, you're living with two girls. Are you praying for a boy? And I thought, well, that, that's a good plan. You know, maybe that'd be a good thing. It sounded like a plan. But God gave us something better than a son. He gave us a Gabrielle. So Gab's the little one, and Elise, that's my stepdaughter. So that's our small little family there. And uh, so now we're living in a house with, I'm living in a house with three girls. And uh, people are saying, well, are you, are you praying for a boy? And I'm like, well, I don't know if I want a boy because I, I don't know what I do with a boy because I've, I've been a girl dad all these years. I don't know what's going to happen. So we, we prayed and, and thought, uh, hey, what are we going to do about this? And um, Denise got pregnant again. And, uh, and uh, God gave us a gauge. <laughs> and I learned very quickly that boys are different than girls. And uh, so we had a boy. We were done. I mean, we were done and done. We had just taken the car seat out two weeks later when, boom, we realized she was pregnant again. Surprise. And God, God gave us something better. He gave us a Camden and uh, so now he's spoiled. He's the baby of the family. But it gave us balance, two girls, two boys. So we had a plan. We tried to work our plan, but God's plan wasn't our plan. But God, God's plan was better. And uh, I want you to hear this. That God is able, and God's plan is better. And so when you don't get the job that you want, tell yourself, if you're in chapter 2 or you're waiting in chapter 3, that there's something that God has in store for you in chapter 4 that's even better than what you ever dreamed about in chapter 1, 2, or 3. God's plan is better. Or when you wanted to get married and the, the person that you wanted to marry you didn't get married to, tell yourself God's got something way better than that fixer-upper, and you're going to see in chapter 4 that you're going to thank God all day long that you didn't get married along the way to that, guy, that person because God's plan is better. The text goes on in verse 17. The neighbor women said... Now at last, Naomi has a son again. 
and they named him Obed, which means servant of God. He, came, he became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. Why does this lineage matter? Uh, you know, they, they list the names here. The, one of the major themes of the book of Ruth is the providence of God, and we gave the definition for that. It's when God uses natural circumstances to bring about his supernatural will. And last week we talked about that. It's a lot like the Hebrew language. You read that backward than the way we do with the English language. We, we read Hebrew right to left. And last week uh, we, we talked about it's... Uh, when you're looking at the lineage and the blessings of God and the providence of God, it's best understood when it's viewed backward. And so what do we see with these names? We put the chart up there last week. I want to put it up there again. We see what we just read. And at the end of the chart, when you're reading back at the end of the chart, at the end of the chart, we, here we go. We, we have Jesus and Mary and Joseph. Now we're looking backward and we see the same listed there, that David was the son of Jesse whose dad was Obed, and who was Obed's parents? Ruth and Boaz. Ruth and Boaz. So we go all the way back to Ruth chapter 1. Who is Ruth? Well, she is a Moabite woman, and what's the significance of that? Well, she came from a people who were not the people of God, and this sinful Moabite woman turned to the God of Israel, and he redeemed and restored her, and she left Moab to the blessings of Bethlehem, I want you to think about this, that when she married Boaz, that that was her second marriage. This was nothing that she had planned. This was not in her plan. So if you find yourself feeling like you're, you're at plan B right now, remember God's plan is better. God has something better. And, and that's the progression of Ruth's identity. I want to show you something. Uh, we call these little hidden treasures. And uh, next week, we're going to talk about this in particular when we're going to talk about reading and understanding the Bible. So I got a series plan that's coming up next week. I think we're going to do some giveaways on that as well. And uh, so we're trying to figure that out. But make sure not to miss next week so we can learn about how do we find these hidden treasures in the Bible when we're reading along the way. Um, so I want to show you this little treasure. Ruth is her identity is strengthened by God, even when she's not seeing God, but as she grows closer in her relationship with God, he transforms her. So early on, she sees herself as, I am a foreigner. I don't even belong here. And then she says to Boaz, I'm lower than your servants. I'm not even worthy to be one of your servants. I'm lower than that. And in chapter 3, she starts to uh, see herself differently. And, and when she tells Boaz, I am your servant, and then in chapter 4, guess what she sees herself as? I am a wife. I am a isha in the Hebrew. And she gets to know the goodness of God. As she grows, she sees the goodness of God, and her identity change changes. So the book of Ruth, the Old Testament book of Ruth, has the gospel all over. I mean, think of this. Who is Ruth? She's a foreigner. She's a stranger. She's lost and broken in Moab. She leaves Moab to pursue the one true God in Bethlehem. And she feels lower than a servant, but Boaz loves her. He redeems her as the kinsman redeemer and restores her and saves her. And that's why I want somebody to hear today. If you are in Christ, that is your story. That's your story. Because once God felt far away from you. You were spiritually a foreigner, but God had something better for you, better than you could ever imagine, and he sent his one and only son to die on the cross. The one who was perfect died for all of our sin. He was buried. God raised him on the, on the third day, and he's there for salvation today for anyone who calls on his name. He can redeem you today, and we see this very same story in the New Testament in this little cram-packed peace in the letter to Ephesus when Paul told us this same story in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You, you lived in this world without God and without hope. But now, somebody say, but now, but now, but now, you have been united with Christ 
Jesus. What's that mean? Well, Paul says in chapter 6 of the book of Romans, he fleshes out all of these definitions that those who are baptized into Christ are united with Christ through the blood of Christ. And once you were far away from God, but now, but now, you have been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. So now, you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You're members of God's family. You're now Isha. You're a wife. You're the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is the church. And you're the light of the world. You're the child of a living God, joint heirs with the kingdom of Christ Jesus. That, that's who you are as being one who is redeemed. So when you know him and you feel stuck in Moab, well, I want you to know you're going to find the blessings of God in Bethlehem. So if you're stuck in the in-between, stay faithful to God because he is Yahweh Wayitten. Our God is able to do exceedingly more than all we could even ask, think, or imagine according to his power that's at work within you. And and while you're waiting, God's still working. Even now, you might feel like you're in the middle of brokenness. But God's plan is better. There's a chapter 4. Somebody say chapter 4. There's a chapter 4. His blessings are real, and he's working to bring things about to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And, And when you look back like reading Hebrew you'll be able to see the hand of the providence of God on your life as you move through season to season to season. Would you pray with me? Well, Father, we thank you that, oh, you were loving us way back in the book of Ruth and preparing a Moabite woman to be part of the lineage of your son, Jesus Christ, who would save us. And for those today that are in a season where they don't want to be in, they don't want to be in it, they're a chapter of their life that just seems disappointing, I pray that you would give them what only you can give them and, and that you give supernatural peace. You give us strength to grow our faith as we trust in you. And for those who today might be a little bit like Ruth and Moab, not walking intimately and they're lost and broken. You tell us that we're dead in our sins and only you have the cure, that you loved us so much. While we were sinners, you tell us to send us your one and only son, Jesus, through the lineage of a Moabite woman to save the world, to redeem us. And just like Ruth was made new, you make us new. And for, for those today who are ready to leave Moab, to step into a new life, into the blessings of Bethlehem, I pray, O Lord, they would take that step today that you say very clearly in your word that whoever believes and is baptized, calling on the name of Jesus, will be saved, will be transformed, will be forgiven. And O Lord, we pray this in Jesus' holy name we pray. And everybody who agreed said amen and amen.